righty. We are here with Boyd Varty. Thank you so much for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Yeah, oh, thanks so much. It's great to get on with you guys. Awesome. We are extremely excited to be chatting to, to you today, and it might, that might be the understatement of the year so far. But uh, what we wanted to just start off with is like, you know, if you have someone that has spent time in the African bush, then you know there's a special energy there. So when I started listening to your podcast, Track Your Life, part of the depth and the beauty of it was sort of your ability to be teleported right next to you in the treehouse and, uh, and hear and feel what it's like to be there sort of in that nature and, and with you. Uh, and it reminded me of sort of sitting around a campfire, having a sense that those moments in front of the flames are some of the most special and meaningful ones in one's life, you know? And uh, so, so to honor that, that wisdom, I thought I would share a quick quote from your book, uh, Cathedral of the Wild. <clears throat> And you write, as the night grows darker, we kick the logs bit by bit into the fire, giving the solid wood to the flame, keeping its warmth in our our bodies as our gift from the trees. And I feel like that could set the tone for our chat as it sort of speaks to the interconnectedness of it all and uh, the fact that we're all part of nature and we're not separate from it. And uh, just like with each other in the universe, so really, really beautiful words that you get in there. <clears throat> so to Thanks start this so off, much. Boyd, pleasure. To start this off, tell us about the absolutely epic sojourn you have recently returned from and how has the integration post-immersion in the bush for 40 days and 40 nights been? Well, firstly, it's, you know, it's a wonderful thing to, I guess, be turning 37 this year and to, in my 36th year, had one of the best experiences of my life. I spent a lot of time in nature, but there was something, I spent a lot of time in nature, I spent a lot of time guiding people in nature, but there was something about 40 days and 40 nights of solitude that was incredibly profound for me. Just the scope of time alone and what that meant is even if you, if you could imagine you go camping with a friend, you know, you might go for a long time, but there's always this one other person that you can turn to, that you can chat to, that you can tune your attention to. When you're by yourself, there's just, there's just no one else to turn to. And what starts to happen is over the course of time, it just continues. Your attunement to the natural world around you just continues to deepen and deepen and deepen. And the solitude, you know, as you said, like sitting around, a fire with lions roaring and night jars calling and the stars above you every night alone for a couple of hours, not reading, not checking your phone, not, not tuning into anything, just being. It was like this incredible depth of stillness that was establishing itself in me. And, and it just got deeper and deeper. And then, you know, sort of a kind of a magical thing starts to happen around you. I, I actually think of it in, when I mean, you mentioned the integration, but I think of it as the first part when you go alone into nature, the kind of shedding. You know, there's a feeling of like pulling off a shell, the shell of modern life. And what's actually happening is you're kind of getting your attention back. If you imagine your attention's been in all the things of the world, the news, the latest crisis, your phone, WhatsApp. You start to shed that away. And as that starts to happen, the, the Aboriginal people say, you know, modern culture is three days deep. I, I really love that idea. The feeling that after three days in nature, there's like a shift in priorities and you just feel yourself come back to yourself in a really interesting way. Then the next phase after shedding that I, that I sort of experienced was a kind of a tuning. And what happens is, is because your attention is not being pulled in every direction, you start to just focus on nature around you. And the way that I think of it is like, when you attune to something that is alive, nature is alive all over around you. It makes you more alive. It's like if you attune to tech and to, you know, that kind of digital space, you become almost robotic. And you attune to the organic energetic field of aliveness around you. You feel yourself becoming more like that. So I always say, you know, where your attention goes, your life goes. The next phase is just a kind of radical simplifying 
where your day, you know, oh man, our lives are so complex. There's so many things we have to do. There's so many things coming at us. When you're out there for a long time, it's like the day gets this incredibly simple rhythm and you're very productive, but you're still and at rest. And then suddenly something moves in you and you have a task you have to do. You have to fetch firewood. You have to make a fire. You have to go track an animal. And, and you do that and you're totally present in that. And then you move back into rest. And there's this like cycle of, of simple action and then rest. Simple action, then rest. And I felt like it was teaching me how to live. You know, it was like teach it, helping me remember how to live again. And then the final part has been the integration, as you mentioned, which, yeah, man, it's living in a tree is so unique. You know, you're living in this alive ecosystem. You're up, <laughs> you're living up um, in the branches. So it's almost like the aspect of your life is different. You're looking down at life below you. Gives you this unique perspective that you live in. There's like a freedom to being up there in the branches. You're, you get to know the animals around you. And then you come home and it was quite an adjustment to uh, being back between four walls. I felt, you know, I literally felt quite like boxed in again. And suddenly, you know, is the world just couldn't be more crazy right now. And suddenly that was in my consciousness after this like period of very, just, you know, very spacious mindset. So to be honest with you, the integration has been uh, hard. It was the first few days going in was difficult and coming out was actually much more difficult than I thought. But I've been trying to integrate that same pattern of living, of being attuned to the natural world, just, you know, staying in a state of simplicity, uh, developing a pattern between action and rest, and just trying to be more like an animal rather than like a, a machine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and is there anything like that you've like, would, would you do this again? Do you think like sort of, sort of just to create that connection again? Cause I'm sure you probably lost, lost a little bit of it since you've come back, but would you, this be like an annual yeah. thing or anything? Absolutely. I mean, I think that what was so incredible about it is, you know, sometimes life can be a bit backwards. So what I mean by that is one of the reasons I went in was I wanted to understand the mystic in nature. Why did the mystics go to nature? And a mystic to me is, is someone who makes up their own life and lives by, their, by a kind of inner guidance. And one of the great inspirations was St. Francis of Assisi. And St. Francis is the only saint that when you look at him, he's looking down at the earth rather than up at heaven. He was connected to nature. And he gave up the life of a rich merchant. He was the son of a rich merchant. And he, he, he renounced everything to go and live in the wild. Uh, and, and his vow was really a vow of poverty. But to this day, St. Francis is the number one economic driver of the entire Assisi region. So it's like this incredibly backwards thing where this renunciate becomes the economic center of the area. And for me, you know, it's like who has six weeks to go and like be alone in nature? Uh, like there's work to be done. Like we have pressures. We it was one of the most artistically productive times uh, of my life. I was just producing so much writing. It was like I could hear the voice of nature and it was coming through me. I wrote for, I wrote, you know, I think probably quality work for about two or three hours every day, which for a writer, if you can get, wow. you know, two hours out, it's pretty good going because it's, so, you know, I think I'm going to go every year and I'm going to go with the understanding that it is a part of my work to go and be quiet in nature and to hear the voice of nature and to write. So it's going on the calendar as like, you know, rather than like a, a time away from work, that is my work, you know? Um, it's almost like you, I, you, you talk, sorry, sorry. You know, I just, I think every, every time I go and do it, I want to try and do six weeks, 40 days and 40 nights every year. And I think every year it'll evolve and it'll be amazing to watch it over time and think how I'm changing inside of that set sort of period of time and an annual experience. You're going to say something, Greg? No, no, no. It's all good. No, no. It's all good. Okay, cool. So, so yeah, boy, I must say like Craig sent me before we chatted, he, he sent me like one of the podcasts, uh, I think it was day 17. And he's like, you must listen to this and, you know, just to get a, sort of an idea around like Boyd and what he's doing and stuff. And then, I, I'm here in Brazil at the moment. So every like day I go like walking on the beach for well a couple of hours, pretty much most days. And I listened to number 17 and I was like, damn, I need to go listen to more. So, <laughs> so I quickly, like I was far away on, on my walk and I came back to the house to kind of download 
some more podcasts. And then I think I downloaded to like number, number six or something. I was like, cool, this will, this will be enough. And that was including the, the two mm-hmm. intros that you have. And I was gutted, bud, because I'd like walked about, I think, an hour that way. <laughs> and I knew, okay, cool. If I've got about an hour of podcast left, I wish I had more. <laughs> so I had to come back again to download more <laughs> to, to, listen to, to listen to the rest. But like, it was, it was such an incredible series of podcasts. Like, seriously, thank you so much for doing it. Like, literally, I felt like I was, I was in there with you. I was learning so much, like, you know, just through obviously your experience, but also the, the beautiful quotes that you had, the readings from books, how you presented it yourself as well. So it was such an amazing experience just listening to that. So thank you for documenting it because I know, like you said in the beginning, you were questioning, should you like even kind of document it? But like, honestly, the best decision ever, like for allowing us to kind of live through you in the tree that time. So so yeah, just, just amazing, like emotion, just very, very powerful. But, you know, just, just kind of looking back and, and you being a storyteller, you know, what are your thoughts on, on kind of like the power of stories and the lost art of sitting, you know, around a campfire telling stories? Well, firstly, thank you. That's really kind of you. And again, like the, like the St. Francis thing, it was this, this strange sensation of like being totally alone in nature but I spoke to more people every day than I probably ever had in my life because like, you know, the world was in such a strange place. People were in isolation and the podcast really traveled. And so it was like, I was totally alone and I was yet, I was connected with all of these people going through the strange and sometimes very difficult times. So it was a very, it, it, it felt like it worked out really well. The, the, the sort of what was meant to happen happened. And then to your question, you know, I have thought for some time now that my whole life I've believed that there was a kind of a shift in consciousness that was trying to happen. And I always thought that, you know, the restoration of our relationship with nature could only come out of a shift in human consciousness. And so from the time I was pretty young, I would ask myself like, well, what are the ways to accelerate a a transformation in human consciousness? Like what are the things what are the mediums that, that like put people into different states that help them awaken to different ways of being in the world and, and life? And one of the things that came to me during that time was that like the frequency of a new consciousness is campfire. And, and something so fundamentally and archetypally human is awakened inside of us when we sit down around a fire, when we witness each other, when we share out of a place that is very un you know it's it's not it's not a performance when people tell stories around fire Mm -hmm. it's almost like there's an intelligence there that you sort of know which story to share next and then that story triggers someone else's story and there starts to be this kind of like very intelligent movement of sharing and openness and in that beautiful glow of the flames you know i often think that we live in a neon culture a culture that is blinded by this like brightly colored neon light. And I think that firelight is soul light. It's in, in the, Mm. in a quiet night in the glow of a fire. It's like you can see a person's essence and then they share. So I just think it's, and I think I mentioned it a few times there. I mean, I'm a huge believer in like what constellates when you turn the lights off and people go and sit around the fire and tell stories. And a lot of my work now has been traveling around uh, mostly America and wherever I go, we make a fire Now, you know, usually people will invite me and then we make a fire and it's dark and there's just the firelight. And then I stand up and start telling stories and it instantly, it's a doorway for people, you know, and it's not just my story. It starts to connect them with their stories. It starts Mm. to connect them with a different way of being. And the story themselves, and this is, and this is kind of an, in, an interesting thing to say, but maybe I would say it like this. Uh, a long time ago, the ancient people, so, you know, the people who were still connected to the earth, they knew that this time was coming. And so they passed down through the generations what they called the three seeds 
and the three seeds were the mystical traditions. And so for generations, meditation paths, yogic paths, breathwork paths, shamanic paths were passed down generation to generation. The second seed was stories. And so stories would be passed down. And what they were actually passing down is when someone told a story, the feeling you would get as you sat there and you listened to that, that feeling was the code of being a human, whether it was pain, whether it was empathy, whether it was compassion. When you heard that story, it conjured that feeling and that feeling was the doorway to being human. And then the third reminder that they sent down through the ages to us for this time was native people themselves who just, whose mission was just to survive till now, to be a living monument to a different time. So to me, stories are full of code that remind us how to be people. Hmm. And so I think it's infinitely important to remember how to tell, put our voice into the world and how to receive another person's voice. Hmm. That's beautiful and what super well said. And I guess it's this, it, you know, the art of actually sitting there you talk about not putting the whole log in, you know, you, you, one of your, I think tracker friends speaks about that. And there, there's a certain reverence that you can bring to the idea of sitting around the fire and making it, making it an, in, an intention behind what you're doing also adds that certain uh, element to it. Excuse the pun there, I suppose that that is, is really special. Yeah, there's, it, when you make a fire there and you, and you gather around it, there can be ritual. Immediately, people will start to move more slowly. As I said, that rhythm comes in of when people are talking and then you know that moment around a fire where everyone just falls silent for a while mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. sits and then something starts up. And it's almost like those intangible dynamics, the sharing, the receiving, the ritual, the reverence, the intention of why we gather. All of those things are the kind of pillars, the foundational pillars out of which meaning then starts to arise. And there's something about a, a group of people who come together with intention, immediately the possibility for, for meaning to start to constellate in that space is deeper. And that is mm. some of what I think we are wrestling now in modern life is the speed of it, the complexity of it, the convenient, the obsession with convenience of it, the consumeristic nature of it, those things start to strip out in a very, in a way that's very difficult to see. They start to strip the core of what makes something meaningful away from it. I tell one of the stories in the podcast, and maybe this is kind of reaching towards what I'm saying, but I, t I tell the story of the, the warden of this reserve back in the, the late 50s, early 60s. He's a guy by the name of Harry Kirkman. And Kirkman was like as old school as you can possibly imagine. He was as hard as they come. He, Kirkman didn't believe on when he was out on patrol on the land, he didn't believe in drinking water during the day. He said it was a mark of softness. You, just, when you, you only need to drink water when you get back to your camp at night. So it's just incredibly hard and he once got mauled by a lion and he was wearing a kind of a thick jacket, but it mauled him through the arm. And he eventually got onto one of those old ringer phones. He said, doctor, do you have anything for lion bite? I mean, just <laughs> super, super hardcore. But my dad was telling me that he was once mending a fence with Kirkman and they needed a particular screwdriver. And so my father said to him, Oh, we don't have a screwdriver. Okay. I'll go to town to get it. And this appalled Kirkman. He said, go to town? What are you talking about? You bloody townies. He called him anyone who would just go to the city townies. You bloody townies. Um, think you can just buy everything to solve problems. And for the next three days, Kirkman made a screwdriver. And the thing that struck me about it is, I mean, one is the speed, the taking the time. Two is like the craft, the willingness to be like tactilely involved in mm. your own life. And then three is like eventually when you take that screwdriver out of its box a year later, like you are fun, you are more deeply connected to what that screwdriver means. There's been like a connection with it. 
And so it's a, it's a funny way of saying that that's how mean, meaning constellates when we're in touch with our life in a way that feels real. And so many of the people I coach nowadays, they say that they feel like, feel like they're in their life, but life is like happening behind a pane of perspective. There's a feeling of like, it's all going on, but I don't feel connected to it. I don't feel engaged in the meaning of it. And so meaning making is, is an art form of, of like working out how to get back involved with your own life, as opposed to it just happening out here at the push of a button. Hmm a bit of a tear there <laughs> no no this is it's beautiful <laughs> that's uh this is what you do so well and and you know you've got it's just so beautiful to think of it like that is is the care to, i mean nowadays you can't almost fathom three days for something like that but you know i can just think of my own grandfather's toolbox and i and i think of uh, the, the old, all these old tools that to me seem so old and, and rickety and but he'd had them since he was a kid and and I guess that's part of that same kind of mindset where you think, oh, we just go get another bloody Stanley knife or whatever, just get it, you know, it's just so easy to go and do that these days. And uh, I think it's and just it just, a great and reminder. It, and it just keeps going, you know, the, the, like the scope of convenience keeps stacking on us until the point where it's like, it's easy, it's, it's easy to do everything, but you never really feel the satisfaction of being involved in something. You know, right down to like, I always laugh when I'm in America, you, you know, you're going to make a fire outside and what someone gets is they get this like packaged, like fake log that you light with a gas lighter on one side. And then it's, it's essentially like a, like a fire starter log. But, and I just think to myself, oh. oh my God, that's, that's not, that's not the way to go about it, you know? But so, <laughs> so we lose this like tactile encounter with life. And then the other thing that really struck me while I was up in the tree that goes back to these foundations of meaning is, you know, one of the things that happens when you're on tech all the time is it absorbs your attention. And as it absorbs your attention, what happens is one on level one is like the addiction to it. Level two is you stop imagining. And I feel like another one of the real pillars of meaning is the capacity to imagine and then create. And th that ability to like kind of imagine what you would like your life to look like, to imagine what you would like to create, to imagine what you would like to your day to be like. And then to like live into that imagination is another place where a lot of meaning is created. And when we're just like lying there and it's just occupying our mind with, you know, CNN, the news, whatever is the latest, it, it's like a, that is being stripped from us too. So, so I felt, I felt a lot of these, these feelings of, you know, stillness and simplicity, imagination, tact the tactile nature with which we engage with life, the way that, the way we tend to what we care for and how we interact with that as the kind of doorway to the places where meaning becomes dense in our life again. Yeah, yeah, but for me, it was so powerful, like, you know, just listening to you speak about like making a cup of coffee, like, you know, just like what an event that became, you know, and then that also then sort of like set off a whole bunch of thoughts for me, which I was like messaging Craig about and I was like, you know, isn't it amazing how we all say like, we don't have time to do things in our life. Like, you know, I don't have time to cook dinner. Like I'm too busy. Like, but no, hang on. This is like one of your you know, this is one of the, the essences of being a human is like cooking your own food, making your own food, like enjoying the process. But, but we make excuses because we're too busy with our day-to-day -day job. And it's just like, it's like, hang on. Okay. You, you too, you definitely need to change something in your life. If you're kind of too busy to do things like that. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And you know, man, I don't think reverence, and intentionality can occur at high speed, you know? So like literally if you're moving, if you're moving too fast for that, if you're moving too fast to prepare something to nourish you, to connect with a loved one, to in, be engaged in a task that, you know, really absorbs you. If you're moving too fast for all of that, your, your life is going to be short on the sacred. It's going to be short on reverence. It's going to be short on, 
Um, and if it's short on reverence, it's short on awe, it's short on beauty, it's short on uh, joy, it's short on wonder, it's short on all of the things that like really feed us. Um, and that stuff just can't, it, it cannot occur at high speed. And that's why if you, even in, like, and the Buddha was onto this, you know, that when the, the, the Buddha's first like proponent was stop, just stop for a moment. And when you stop, you can start to actually catch up with yourself and what it means to be a person and what it means to live. But yeah, I mean, I think that that's probably a good marker. If you're too far, if you're moving too fast to actually like engage with the food you're creating for yourself, you, you need to ask yourself if this is really all worth it. And that's coming from the world's best foremost a sweet potato cooker right there. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. You just, you just, the art form of the sweet potato, I was on top of that. <laughs> but you know, I will, so I will admit that just to roll back one, like I'm notoriously um, like undomestic. I'm not good around, I'm not, I'm often not good at that sort of stuff, but it reminded me like to be engaged in the simple things in life is, is very important. Yeah, you read something from, I can't remember who now, and you said there were a few things and it, it was, the whole passage was super profound. And you just said, and one of the things you said, there's, there's like reverence in the soap dish. Uh, and, I, and that for me somehow stood out for me. I'm like, you can find meaning in literally anything. And like you say, even if you're not a great cook, that's okay. It's the, it's the, the doing, it's the practice of it that that brings you right here now. And so, yeah, I think even, even if we think we suck at something, I think it's still worth it to pursue these kind of things. Hey? Man, the, the, the willingness to be engaged and to be bad and to, and, you know, you can extend these metaphors kind of infinitely, you know, in my, you know, I have a strange life as a tracker on, uh, of, and in the wilderness on one hand, and then I travel extensively. I work in the personal transformation field and, and those kind of two strange Venn diagrams came together for me but you know if you haven't had any time to engage in the things that we were just chatting about like when you come to that moment in your life where you suddenly feel lost and empty you know if you haven't had the time to prepare a meal to engage with a loved one when it comes to like now trying to work out what I'm what I want to do with the next 10 years of my life what actually brings me to life I mean, you're very disconnected from some of the place to start, you know, like, like those things are very foundational. And then if you arrive there, I guess what I'm trying to say is if you've been moving at high speed in that, like too fast for everything, everything coming at you, handling it as it comes, da, 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 da. suddenly when you arrive at a place where you actually want to start looking more deeply into your life, man, it's a big journey back from where you've been to a different way of being. And in order to find a life that feels more authentic to you, more alive, you have to be connected in here. You have to be able to hear this voice. You have to be mm -hmm. moving at a pace where you can be in tune with yourself. Mm -hmm. Embodied more. So just talking about stories from like before, you've obviously got so many great stories, but you know, you must have heard some incredible stories from your great grandfather, your grandfather, your parents, the early days at Londolozi. There must have been amazing times and amazing stories that have come from that. But can you just briefly tell us how that land came to be, but also maybe the sort of things that you admired in your forefathers and foremothers and, and these people, especially your great grandfather who kind of took that first step. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the story of the land begins in 1926 at a tennis party in Johannesburg with the intake of too much gin. And what happened was my grandfather heard about these bankrupt cattle farms adjacent to the Kruger National Park. And the farms were bankrupt because it's, you know, very marginal terrain for cattle, but also because the lions were eating the cattle. And, and what was interesting about it to me is like in a moment from a place very deep inside of himself, he knew that he was going to buy. Literally right then they went down to the deeds office and sight unseen they bought this property. And then they would come down here in the winter months, uh, 1926, you know, there was nothing here. And they would come to hunt lions, which was, you know, very dangerous pastime. 
and that kind of that's how my great grandfather lived that's how my grandfather grew up from the time he was extremely young out on this land in the winter months that's how my father grew up in fact my father was telling me the other day about a lion hunt that he went on when he was about 15 and you know when you can you can just say like oh lion hunting is dangerous but when you actually think about it basically there are two outcomes to lion hunting either the lion dies or one of you dies there's really no middle ground and so if you could if you could imagine i don't know if either of you have kids but like taking your you know your 13 14 year old son and saying okay off we go to roll the dice i mean it's quite outrageous in the modern context so he was telling me about it, and i just realized like god it's a it's a it's a hell of a thing to do with your children you know but my family came here to hunt lions and then when my grandfather died in 1969 my father was about 15 and my uncle was about 17 and all of the family advisors said well first things first you've got to get rid of that place where you used to go hunt lions hunting lions is dangerous it's a bad idea you've got to get rid of it and my father stood up as a teenager in the meeting and uh, from that same place, deep inside of himself, he said to all of these captains of industry who were the family advisors, he said, uh, no, we're going to keep it. And they said to him, young man, you don't know what you're talking about. How do you propose to take care of your mother now? And he said, I don't know, but we will find a way. We will make the land viable. We'll make it pay. And that's really how we got into the safari business. And so my father and uncle launched this absolute ragtag safari business. It was, there were three mud huts and I'm told when it rained, people would go outside for shelter and they would, my sort of my uncle and my mother who joined soon after, they would live in the mud huts and then when the few guests came down in the weekend, they would go live in a caravan at the back. It was the one, the Land Rover had a broken chassis that they had welded together and so you could go out on a game drive and the Land Rover would break in half. It was a very wild sort of scene you really didn't see any animals. And the reason you didn't see any animals was because the, the animals had been hunted and so they would run, they would try and get away from you. And the other is that where the land had been overgrazed by the cattle, there was very high scrub. And the scrub had come back to almost, almost as a defense as the moisture content of the soil had dropped, the scrub had come up. And so, you know, if you saw a few antelope, that was like exciting. There were animals here, but you didn't really see them. And so the, the, the business kind of limped along. And then the arrival of a man called Ken Lee. And Ken was this kind of maverick ecologist. He had a deep connection uh, with nature, almost a spiritual connection with nature. And he arrived and he said to these two young guys who were trying to get the safari operation going, he said, if you want this place to work, you must partner with the land. You must think of the animals as your kin and you must bring the local people in. So said, well, partner with the land, what do you mean? And he started to take them out and show them where when the rain fell, there were these deep eros erosive furrows. They were losing all the moisture. And he showed them how you cleared the scrub and you packed it into those furrows. And as they did that, the grassland started to return. And that's about 10 years into that process, I kind of, I was born and what I remember growing up is seeing that process of the land being cleared and these furrows being plugged. And I remember seeing grasslands returning. I remember seeing animals returning. And so from the time I was very young, somewhere into my young psyche, I saw the land restoring. I saw a kind of healing taking place. And it, that, that vision, although I didn't know it at the time, went into me very deeply. And all of my when I look back on it now, I see how all of my work has been centered around the idea of, of that kind of healing, of restoration of land. It did away with hunting. The, the animals got to know that they, they meant them no harm here. And now, you know, Londolozi is this incredible wilderness. It's a place where we regularly view lions, leopards, highest population of leopards in the world. And just when you're here, you're, there's this feeling of incredible harmony. The animals are totally wild but they allow you into their world. And so, yeah, that's, that is kind of what, and what I saw was a shift in consciousness that took place. You know, they went from, you know, these ragtag hunters, 
then they went into a time where after my grandfather died, they were traumatized, but they were trying to create this, this kind of reserve. And, and then through the guidance of Ken, they started, they started to change and they started to feel connected to the land. They started to understand how the land fit together. They started to understand their relationship with the natural world. And so, and then that set them on a totally different trajectory. And so, and, and that, I think the evolution of that story is that, you know, having grown up in a, seeing that restoration of the land, I've always believed a restoration of our relationship with nature is possible. And, and then when I was in my early twenties, I was going through a very difficult time, a time when I was, you know, really lost time where I was, I was suffering with pretty severe depression. I was working as a safari guide at that time and totally by chance, I ended up guiding this woman who came in. She, came, she had come on safari. She was a fascinating woman. She had been a Harvard professor uh, of psychology and sociology. She had taught art at Harvard. Then she had gone to Thunderbird University, which is a business school in Arizona. And there she had taught a course on how to interview well for uh, job interviews. And what she worked out was that the way to interview well for a job was to really care about what you were interviewing for. So she had de developed the system to help her students get really in touch with what they loved so that they could interview in appropriate, you know, segments in the, in the workforce. And then one day she read about herself as America's first life coach because she had developed this process. So when I met her, as I said, I was severely depressed. I guided her for three days. Her name was Martha Beck. I guided her for three or four days. And then at the end of that, she said to me, uh, I remember actually during that time, one of the days we were driving around and, and I had told her about the restoration of the land. And then she said to me, the restoration of the planet will come out of a shift in human consciousness. And I had one of those moments, I guess, like my grandfather had when he heard about the land, like my father had. When she said that, I felt something inside of me go, whatever, what you just said, that's my path. And then, you know, about two days after that, we were standing in the car park of this, of this, you know, of the lodge. And she looked at me and she said, you know, I'm ready to talk to you when, when you're ready. And I'm, you know, I'm standing there with my rifle, and like a safari guide. And I was like, well, what do you mean? She said, I can see what you're, what you're struggling with, but I, and I'm ready to talk when you're ready. And when she, I don't know, you know, if you've, if you've ever been in a very difficult place in your life, when someone sees you like that, when they see that you're struggling and the, the energy of compassion and presence that she had as she was talking to me, I just absolutely broke. And I started like sobbing. And it was a strange moment where the guide was like, holding this woman and just crying. And, and then from that moment on, she became my mentor and she guided me out of uh, the depression. She guided out of me out of that lost place. And in journeying out of that place myself and, and watching how she guided me out of it, that was my real foundations of becoming a healer and a guide. And so my whole life then became about the restoration of, of nature, but also of our nature, of, of who we really are. And so those, those the sort of the Venn diagram started to come together in a really unusual way. Sure, bud. What a beautiful story, man. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I mean, in name dropping there with Martha Beck, she's like this amazingly <laughs> famous lady, isn't she? And so that's just so amazing that, that she just went to you. I, I see you. I kind of feel, you know, and I'm here for you sort of thing. Isn't that, isn't that so powerful? You know, like just when someone acknowledges us like that and they, yeah. Oh, and, and she just, you know, she just absolutely backed me from that moment on. She was present to every moment of my healing. And in fact, she put me on my path, really. You know, she put me onto my life path. And that's, I've become, as I've gotten as I've been on this journey, I've become really, really deeply interested in, in mentorship. I think it's something that we're missing. You know, we're, we're in so in such need of creating more opportunities to guide and uplift and come alongside people. 
And so an amazing thing about being mentored is if you've been mentored, it's like naturally you want to support other people. It mm. just starts to, when you've been like shared with like that, it's so abundant. And so, yeah, that's, that's another thing that's really up for me at the moment too, is like, how do we create spaces that allow for more, more mentorship to flow naturally? Mm, for sure. Yeah. You know, what I hear you saying is when you, when you drop, when you create more opportunities to really drop into an, a certain knowing a certain truth, like that, what happened to you, you were in that space sort of serendipi- serendipitously, but it could, you can create more of those spaces, you know, and then for people to dr- embody and tr- drop into that real knowing. And I think, you knew that how much your life has changed. So, you know, you can change someone else's life. And so and there's that, that like power, you know, that to me is like one of the deepest uh, parts of it is, I mean, is if you can change something small in your life then you show yourself that you could change a lot of things in your life. So like if you can create a little bit of change and if you are someone whose life has changed because of someone else, man, you become a believer. And you know, like getting into the whole like life coaching space when I was a 20 year old, like beer drinking South African, you know, I I was a bit like a life coach, like what have the Americans thought of now? You know, like what is, but what happened is as I traveled with her, as I sat in groups with her, I watched a lot of people become aware of what they were doing that was keeping them out of their authentic life beliefs that they had that were limiting and i watched people when they when they became aware of a blind spot inside of themselves man radical things could change and that's it was really like actually seeing transformation that made me a believer Mm -hmm. that's amazing but what what like what what like say were the two sort of top things that kind of helped you get out of this uh, depression that martha helped you with Oh, man, that's such a good question. Well, I think there were kind of two parts to it. The one was, you know, in my family, we came from this pioneering background. My parents started this thing with this like rugged operation out in the middle of nowhere when they were teenagers. And they just drove. My dad had grown up with a father who had flown in the war and who hunted lions. And I guess what I realized is that like we had one super masculine gear and that Mm -hmm. gear was like, feel nothing, like put your head down and go forward. And that's a great gear to have, but it was severely lacking in dimension. And so what my time with, and, and so what it meant is that you could never process anything that happened. It was like, get over it, you know? And so, and the nature of trauma is, is if you don't build a relationship with what happened, understand it, get to know it, have an encounter with it, it like sits in you and you become frozen in some places. And so the, the two parts of it were the first is she helped me get in touch and make sense of some of the things that had happened to me when I was growing up, some of the scary things, some of the encounters with animals, some of just some of the stuff that had happened that I'd never been allowed to feel or didn't really know how to feel. There was never really permission to feel in my family. And so that was the one part of it. And then the second part was she helped me get in touch with my gifts, like what I could uniquely bring to things, what I had to offer. And funnily enough, the frozen scary places, as I got more in touch with them, they started to become like the doorway into the gift because I started to know that terrain. Like I knew, I knew tra- trauma, I knew depression, I knew violent crime, I knew like physical, physical body trauma. And there were places I had been that I knew. And so I had a lot to offer to people who, you know, had been through those things or were looking for a way out of those things. And so I always say that trauma healed is medicine, you know, like it was like going making, making understanding with what had happened to me became a kind of medicine that allowed me to move forward. And the other crazy thing was, is as I started to heal, as I started to soften and understand, and, you know, I guess we would call it integration of the feminine, learning to allow yourself to feel, 
allowing a certain kind of sensitivity into yourself that becomes presence, that becomes awareness, that becomes being able to be in touch with the moment. As I started to heal, my whole family started to go on a journey. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, and I've seen this now infinitely, like when one person in a family starts to heal, strange things start to unlock around you. And so we all integrated a lot more feeling and it almost took us as a family into this incredible family healing. And now, now we're, we're very open. We're very sensitive. We run healing processes for people and we still have a gear that we can put our heads down and push, you know? So mm-hmm. it's like, it's much more dimensional now. It's not a case of a strength, strength exaggerated becoming a weakness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like the one thing you said there that in your, there were two things I wanted to share. Like the one was the cult of doing, which I thought was actually really funny because like you can just imagine it like just go, go, go and, and don't stop. And I can totally, you know, we can all identify with that with as sort of a South African trait in some ways. But also coming back to the feminine side, you, you, you mentioned something and I thought it really touched me. I wrote it down. It was like, there was a tenderness that you had as a kid, as a kid, which you pushed away. It was unsafe to be yourself and you closed the door to gentleness. And I thought that was really moving. Like, I wonder how many people do that in that sort of super masculinized world. Oh man, you know, we're, well, really wherever there, there is shame that one of the dynamics is that something something has to close. See, because like if the way that shame works is that it's not okay to be yourself. So, so think of it like this, a young boy starts crying. Okay. Now that is, that's what's happening for him in the moment. And everyone turns and laughs at him. Now in that moment, his own emotions aren't safe. So that's the shame. And then the shame starts to shut everything down. And what it means is that you hide who you are and you probably hide, you probably hide the parts of you that feel weak, you know, but you will also start because because shame can't really discern. You also start to hide the parts of you that are gentle and sensitive and beautiful. Shame just means all of the parts of yourself have to remain hidden in some ways. And so you will close yourself to a certain kind of gentleness. You will close yourself to the tenderness. You will close yourself to, you know, you just, it just shuts down access to those places. And so we and usually wherever there has been a certain kind of trauma where there's any kind of shame, well, actually almost any kind of trauma, there's usually shame that starts to, to kind of cloud then who you are. And then, and then, so, so when you start to understand that you have a kind of things that a shame that came into you at a certain age and almost like self-consciousness is, is almost the beginning of that in some ways, like the moment as a kid, you become self-conscious. It's almost like the beginning of a little bit of that. A lot of healing work, a lot of trauma work is about realizing that it is okay for you to be completely who you are sensitive hard and it's all allowed to belong and that's where you know that's that's kind of the evolution of it like it all belongs not just not just one particular kind of part of it Mm, or part of being human (laughs) yeah yeah and then i was also thinking i was also thinking too you know being out in nature was so interesting to me because you know, in, in typically masculine environments, it's like sensitivity is, is sort of archetypally, you know, turned away from. It's like, oh, that's, that's not a place that men are really offered when, when it's growing up. But in nature, sensitivity is key. Like you're tuned, you're sensitive mm-hmm. to your environment. You're aware of an animal's body language. If you're very sensitive in the animal's body language, you can feel their mood. You can feel their emotional state. And so like Renias, who I grew up with, who is this amazing tracker, he's incredibly sensitive, you know? And so I, I was really seeing how nature formats the masculine into a kind of present sensitivity. 
as opposed to just being like hard we're going to dominate nature like, no we want to be in tune with the tracks we want to be in tune with the birds we want to feel what that lion's saying when he's flicking his tail when he when he when he arches his uh, shoulders you know he, he, it's it's a kind of a language of emotion in the natural world mm. oh, i never thought like that yeah. Yeah, it is. It's like, yeah, we need to like listen to each other more. You know what I mean? Like us and nature and, and, and people, of course, in general too. But it's, uh, you, you, you're such a wise guy. So thanks for sharing all of that. I thought it was really, really powerful and beautiful. But just going back a little bit to kind of like mentors. There was a time in your life where one of the greatest men that probably ever existed sort of came into your life. Nelson Mandela, Madiba, and uh, you got to spend, you know, quite a bit of time with him. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Because it sounds like, you know, just quite a special moment in your life and for all of us to hear. Yeah. You know, yesterday with what's going on in America right now and with what's going on in the world, I was thinking so much about Mandela. And one of the things that I've found amazing about him is like his capacity to disrupt the algorithm in some ways like if you think of the sort of the trajectory that South Africa was on by all accounts it should have been a bloody mess and yet his presence sort of totally disrupted the pattern and started to create and started to constellate something completely new and so yeah, I mean, I met him, he came to, he was, after he was released from prison, he went through a period of time where he was adjusting. He wasn't yet the president. He was going to be the president. He had been incarcerated for 27 years. And you can imagine he went in there kind of an unknown or like a revolutionary and he came out this global figure. And so friends of ours who were very involved in the African National Cong Congress said, you know, would you mind having him to stay out in the bush for a while because you know he's going to be away from the public eye it'll give him time to recover so he came to stay with us on numerous occasions and he just had the most phenomenal presence i would take him i remember as a kid i would take him breakfast in bed and we would chat a little bit in the morning he stayed in my family's guest cottage and i guess what i would say now as i've as i've gotten older and my own spiritual practice has developed is i would say that I'm almost certain that during his time in prison, he experienced an enlightenment experience, you know, kind of a shift in consciousness because in his presence, everything kind of formatted differently. And you really felt that. And, you know, there were stories about him and I saw him do it a few times, but, you know, he would be walking through the halls of, of parliament and he would meet members of the nationalist party who had literally been, you know, who had ordered the killing of his people, his countrymen, people, friends of his. And he would meet them and he would greet them by name immediately in Afrikaans. He would inquire about members of their family by name. And instantly he would humanize the moment. He would create a human connection first. And then he was formidable politically, but primarily it was always first person to person. And in doing that, he humanized it for himself, but he humanized it on the other side too. And he started to dismantle these constructs of race and what that meant. He, his presence just started to dismantle them. And even here, there was an occasion where he, after he had stayed with us, my mother was in Johannesburg and she was, she was at the Balalaika Hotel and he was there on presidential duty and he was being escorted across the lobby and he saw her. And he broke away from all of the secret service. I don't know what they're called in South Africa, all the bodyguards. He came over to her, he held her hand and he just chatted with her for, you know, four or five minutes. There's just wow. this incredible feeling too around him that he was everywhere. Like everyone in South Africa seemed to have like a personal account of, of some kind of encounter. <laughs> and yet he was incredibly unrushed. Like when he was with you, there was just this like feeling of like nothing else in the world. And so for me, it was, it was defining too, because I would watch him, you know, he'd walk around the garden in his pajamas. And then I would watch like this old crappy TV we had with like bunny ears on it. And I would, 
and to me, like as an eight-year-old, there's just like this quiet man in the garden. And then I would see him on TV surrounded by like, hundreds of thousands <laughs> of people as images of the release were beamed around the world. And so what I, what I saw in that time was like how he was holding something very human and some like a very, he was just a quiet man in the garden, but he was also holding, he understood that he was a symbol of something that people could believe in. And so he was sort of simultaneously both of those things to me. Hmm. Are you there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm just going to. I'm just going to plug in my battery here. All right. Here we go. So, so I mean, j- just to kind of stay on topic there for a second, like w- what do you think he would suggest and do in these times in America? You know, look, it's not like it's a new thing, but, but what do you think he would say or try and do? I mean, it's such a, it's such an interesting question. And that's what I was, that's what I was sort of sitting with yesterday. And I guess, I guess what he would say is humanize the moment and try and get out of the group perceptive dynamic and and interact with integrity with the individuals around you. You know, like take it out of the movement, the, all of the, the scope of what's happening and wherever you are, reach out, connect, be a part, a one-on-one of the solution. Understand that, like him, he was one man who, who completely changed the direction of the country. He was one man who kicked the algorithm in a totally different direction. He came out and he came out and he, you know, he stepped towards healing where everyone thought he would step towards retribution. And in that he mm. acted, he acted differently. You know, one of the things that I keep wrestling and I'll try and get this to make sense, but you know, in a pattern, like if you work with trauma, there is always a pattern and there is always a logic in that pattern. And, and that's what makes it very intelligent is there's a logic to it. So like, I don't know if you've ever had this encounter, but let's say, for example, there's someone who really wants to connect because they feel lonely underneath. But as a result of wanting to connect so badly, they are like bullshit. They push you. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they're so wanting to connect that you feel spoken at and it starts to create withdrawal. You know, you start to actually want to move away from them, which then reinforces their feeling of isolation. Mm. And so then the pattern like maintains itself and there's a, and there's a logic and there's almost like a symmetry to the way that happens. And so if you're a healer, what they do is they come over to you and they start talking at you and everyone else is feeling that desire to withdraw and you understand that underneath that is a loneliness. And so you say, you know, when you talk to me like that, I can feel you really want to connect. Tell me what's going on about that. Where do you feel like you're not connected? Hmm. And as you sort of step towards them, the pattern changes and they suddenly feel seen and calmed down. And then everyone else in the group sees the loneliness they also feel in that person and moves towards. So like Hmm. you disrupt the pattern. And so what Mandela did is disrupt the pattern. Like it should have been oppression, sort of release retribution. But, it, but he disrupted it when oppression, release, forgiveness, and connection, and, mm. so, and something new reconstituted. And so what I, what I keep thinking is that we as individuals, as healers, as those who want to serve the transformation, with all that's going on in the world right now, we have to continuously, in the moment, be asking ourselves, how do we disrupt the inevitable outcome here? How do we mm. change the nature of this pattern? How do we hit this thing from a totally different angle? How do we create a moment of humanity, a moment of presence? How do we stay out of the echo chambers of group speak and biased positioning? How do we, how do we show up in a way that keeps creating something different around us? So I don't know the answer, but I, I feel like that is sort of a, a deep point of exploration for all of us. Like we've got is to it- hold something different in ourselves that allows it to move differently. Yeah, I, I think that I think that's that, that is amazing. Like, like literally, because I was, mm. I was like on. I I didn't know how big a deal this was. I haven't been like on like the news and social media much the last few days. And then I got got stuck onto it last night. And I was like, I was on Facebook and I was checking. Wow, there's all these people like you know. And then you you go and you sort of start reading the comments and stuff. And you know, people are angry. And and there's you know, quite rightly, 
and then you know like then i went on to kind of linkedin and i'm like linkedin is meant for more you know like jobs and <laughs> business talk and these sort of things and it just like morphed into like another slinging match you know or like just no one was agreeing with each other there about what is going on and just like shouting at each other and i was like what what can what can i do like you know in a way to kind of just help this out and 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 try spread some i don't know connectedness or or brotherly love or whatever it is and and it's almost exactly like what you said there about what what mandela might have done you know i was like cool all that i can do i don't want to do, make like a big post on on social media or whatever all that i can really do is message say you know my my black friends and go you know what i'm thinking of you right now and sending you lots of love and that's how, and and that's the the least confront, confront, confrontational way, I think, you know, as opposed to avoiding these big groups, but also just, it's just, you know, letting people know that you're there for each other. And I think we have to start those small steps because that's how all things start, don't they? Absolutely. And, you know, I was reading yesterday, you know, Viktor Frankl had this idea that came out of the concentration camps that, you know, you can, if you strip away race, and what, he, what he saw in that environment, and I, I can find the quote, but basically there are decent, decent people and, and, and indecent people. You know, and, the, and the goal is to like, find the, inside of what all of that is happening, is just con continue to choose that decency. You know, that is like, like good, like real goodness is understanding that we are all imperfect and just continuing to show up for what is in our integrity to do, you know? And I think that's, that's what we have to do right now. And, and, and impact work wherever you can. So like, to me, I, I love that idea of start close in, like start in your community, start yeah. with the people around you, do what you can, where you are. That's, that's, that seems important. It's a lot of people doing what they can. Mm. Let's start one to thing, shift this thing. One thing that's kind of, it's worked for me in the past is to remember that even the, the, the worst person you can imagine was a child once they were stuff has happened to them. And there's something in there that's, that's so hurtful that has put them on this path and it's their programming. And it's almost not like, Look, I've got to be careful what I say. It is their fault, but it's also there's something where something switched and it changed and they went down this path and, and, and everyone can have some compassion for that, not necessarily the outcome of what happens, but it, for that child, you can, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that helps one connect to like the, the, that human side again. So, but yeah, I think like you say, starting at home is, you know, that's, that's the, the first place and what are we teaching each other and our children and stuff is, is I guess the, the place to begin. Yeah. And I would say, I would say one other thing that is maybe unrelated to what's happening in the world right now, but it's something that I've been really on for a while now. I really believe that part of the discovery of the authentic life, when you start to do your work and you start to get under the layers and you start to get in touch with that, that voice though, that track that is calling you forward to an authentic life, to how you can serve, to how you can bring the, your gifts to the world. Like what, when people do that work and they start to live very authentically, they start to make a different way of living. Instead of looking at society and saying like, Oh, this is what it means to be successful. This is what they start to make their own path. And mm. I think we need a, the, the system that we are in, it, it constellates like this. It creates oppression. It's built on extraction. It's built on endless growth. It's built on rugged individualism at the cost of others. And somehow we have to find those of us who, again, want to be a part of this transformation of consciousness. We have to find a way of living in what native people would call your medicine way, your authentic life, life living in your gifts. When you start to live like that, those, those people who I've encountered who are in that, they are inevitably creative. They live differently and their lives without them being activists become a kind of inspiration because when you're around them, 
you see it's possible to live differently. Like they have, they, they've done it. They live, they're living in a different way. And I just feel like right now, the system keeps recreating th that kind of oppression at every level. The, ex the extraction and the scarcity built into it keeps landing us in the same place. And so we need to like think about living differently. And the only way I know how to do that is to like go wild enough to like find out what's calling you and then live on that and, and sort of make a, make a path outside of culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the culture is what programmed everyone in the first place. And it's the thing that created most of the problems. So therefore a solution is to literally be, think outside of the box. Totally. And, and when Mandela came out of prison, you know, his, like, he was guided by, by that voice inside of him. And it was not necessarily the popular voice. In fact, it maybe wasn't the popular voice, but it was what he knew to do. It was, and, and it took, a, it took us into a totally different direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm really wow. interested in, in living like that as a kind of activism. And, and I should say that people who seem to touch the authentic life, like a couple of things happen. Like one, those people stop wanting stuff. You know, they, they stop wanting more stuff to fill a hole. They, there's an inevitably a kind of relationship with, with stillness that is established. And when you still, you can actually really listen to other people. You can actually see and witness before trying to get your opinion out. Those people feel a natural inclination back to nature. It's like this mm. almost innately, they turn back towards the natural world. They feel an overwhelming desire to serve. Like, you know, even, you know, you guys starting this podcast, I, I can just feel it comes out of a genuine desire to like open up conversations for people. And there's a natural creativity that comes with it. And so those kind of things come together into, and it just starts to happen when you start to live like that. So, so true. Sort of the, the pillars of priority start to change. And people truly, when they're truly embodying these things, that's what shows to others, which then creates the change, not by saying it's by doing again, once again, you know? Yes. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't start in here, if you have undone stuff inside of you, then somehow you'll start to recreate that in the world. You will recreate mm. your pain and your suffering in the world around you. So you start with your own work. <laughs> wow. It's, there's so much, <laughs> there's so much yeah, in there. No, no, it's good. Boy. Thank you, boy. Look, just this, you've had so many interactions, like, you know, you've interacted with Mandela and, and, you know, just name a whole bunch of others, but you know, you've also had lots of interactions with animals. So tell us a little bit about the brotherhood that you experienced with Solly after a croc tried to have you for lunch. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Tolly was just one of these guys who was, he was just gold to be around. He was, he was irrepressible in every way. He was good in the bush. He was such a good tracker. He was, he was fit. He was athletic. He was just, you know, an incredible guy to be around. And him and I had a, a, a very strong bond many years. And then, you know, that it was really solidified sometime in 2002. And what had happened is I'd gone down to the river and I had a few people with me and there was clear water running over sand. And there was a little place where the sandbank fell away. And I sat down on the edge of the river there and my feet were kind of dangling in front of me. And what I didn't know is that there was a croc just sort of out of eye shot. And this croc came out and grabbed me by the leg to try to pull me in. And as it pulled me in, I managed to grab a branch above my head. A very strange feeling having another creature try and eat you. But like eventually my foot went down and started to spat me out and I pulled myself up into the tree. And when I got up into the tree, I managed to move to the other side of this kind of deep channel. And then Solly saw me, he saw me come out of the water. He saw that my leg was very badly damaged. He knew that, it was most likely a crocodile that had, that had done it. 
but he could see that I was in trouble. So he ran across the water and then he got to that very deep section of the stream and he knew the crop was in there. And he just jumped straight in and he waded across to me and he grabbed me and he pulled me up onto the high section of the bank. And he took his shirt off and I wrapped a shirt around my leg. My leg was absolutely mangled from the knee down. And that was, that was the moment that really uh, showed me the character of the man. You know? it's, I, I often ask people, like, I don't know how many people you know who would jump into a deep channel of water that they knew had a crocodile in it to come and get you. But for him, you know, out there, it was as natural as breathing. You know, if I was in trouble, he was in trouble. It's that incredible collective mindset that you see in Africa. And so he came and, uh, and he pulled me out and we were very, very close. We were, we were close already, but we just became, you know, incredibly close after that. And he, he actually passed away a couple of years ago. And I haven't ever told anyone the story, but I went to do a talk about that experience and a few other things as a kind of preparation for a TED talk that I eventually did. And I was standing in front of this crowd of maybe 40 or 50 people. It was maybe about six months uh, since he had passed. And I started my, my talk and there was a slide. I remember pressing the slide and this, this image of him came up on the screen behind me. <laughs> and I, I turned and I looked around at it. And I just saw this, like the, the radiance of his face at that time. And I just absolutely broke. Wow. And I started to cry, but not like a few tears, but like, you know, like an ugly cry, like, like a sob. And wow. everyone sat there and it was the most like, weird experience. And it was kind of beautiful. I could not stop crying for about 15 minutes. It just wouldn't stop. And the crowd just sat there absolutely quietly. And I stood in front of them and it just rolled. It just rolled. Mm. It just rolled. It just rolled. And no one knew. It was it was this incredibly deep like moment. And something people were I, the gratitude that I have for those people and they just knew something that needed to happen was happening. Mm. And and then after that I started talking again and I finished the talk and it was just it was incredibly deep and it, it never happened to me again after that, but it, you know, it was a really like wow. in that moment, all, all of the beauty and the grief and his presence is just there with me. That's, so really anyway, that's a, that's a second story on that, that I haven't told before on top of that. Uh, yeah, well, thanks for sharing that, but that's so, that's so amazing, man. Like, wow, it's really beautiful. Once again, um, sure. I can only imagine it must have been like very emotional for the people listening to you speak, just, you know, seeing that in front of them. So, wow. But, but I guess like talking about, you know, people and there's also, you know, you've also experienced like lots of interactions with, with animals and things like that. So there was an elephant called Elvis. What did Elvis teach you about the African idea of Ubuntu? Well, you know, for me, that Elvis was this was an injured elephant, um, had these very badly deformed back legs, and what we started to realize is that the entire herd was in fact moving slower to accommodate for this this one elephant, um, and often when they would go down steep banks or up a bank, one of the the sort of teenage elephants would go and help him along, so there was definitely a sense of like a little bit of caretaking going on for him. And I guess where it landed for me and where it continues to land for me is that Ubuntu is a, it's a Zulu word. And essentially the root of it means like the peoples, you know, and we, we, it means it, the idea of Ubuntu means I am because of you, um, or people are not people without other people. So I get to experience the deepest parts of my humanity through my connection with you. That's a beautiful idea. And I think, you know, one of the other places you find it is in Japan, the idea that hum being a person is relational. It happens in connection. Um, and I think that we are living in a time now where we have to extend that definition because it's not only through other people that we get to experience what it means to be a person, but it's through our all, through every sentient thing in the living world. Um, and so something about 
being a person has to happen in relation. And I think that we have to realize that without the natural, without a relationship with the natural world, we start to, in some ways, not know ourselves. We start to become foreign to ourselves in some really deeply psychological and strange way. Um, one of the things that became incredibly apparent to me on my recent 40 days is like, it's one thing to go out there and want to know the natural world, but the much more deeper encounter is the feeling and that starts to happen is the feeling that you are known. Like the feeling that somehow there's no loneliness in the presence of the trees and on a starry night and in relationship with the animals and the birds and the way that they're moving around you. There's just this feeling that you know them, but they also know you. You belong there. And it's very, very deep. Um, and it starts to give you something. It starts to give you something that is impossible to describe. It's a very intangible sense of being, of interbeing, of yourself. Um, and so, you know, the remembering of that relational nature of life is absolutely critical. And I think that so much of the homesickness and anxiety that people are suffering with now in modern life, it's a homesickness and an anxiety to be known like that, to belong like that, um, to feel yourself relationally in connection with everything and to look at the stars and to realize that out there is an infinite mystery um, that you are a part of and to watch a flock of birds come past you every day at, at exactly the same time and to realize that there is a pattern and a an interlocking circular nature to the way that they are moving. And it's not random. There's an intelligence to it and you are a part of it. And to look around you to something that is unfolding simultaneously uh, and intelligently and concentrically in these interlocking, you know, spheres of brilliance around you and to realize you're a part of that. Until, until we can remember that, until we can discover ourselves in that relational space again, we're going to continue to feel alone, isolated, and that life is getting more meaningless. It doesn't matter what we do. You know, it's just, it's like a stripping away because we're out of tune with that like first fundamental part of how we experience ourselves. And that, uh, that's like the absolute core of everything that I care about now is just helping people remember that remembering myself and realizing that there's always a feeling that there's something subtly wrong with you mm. when you're not in touch with that and there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> and so yeah. Boyd, what happened with uh, at the top of the hill? Like, I mean, there was such a beautiful story with that actually like sort of flicked the switch with our, Wait, wait, which part of it? I, I think you're maybe you're telling a story about the how the other elephants actually came to help to help Elvis, which is like incredible. I, you know, just such an illustration of how animals can, where we we kind of think we the only ones that can do stuff like that, but animals can actually illustrate this caring for one another, which is so amazing because it slowed the whole herd down basically. Totally. And that's what, and that's what we realized. We realized they were, were totally at one with that relational dynamic. They were in it in a way that we hadn't really realized before, but there's such, there's a much deeper scope of intelligence happening all the time out there. And there's an intricacy of relationship between the animals. And in that case, it was like, you know, normally what you, what the guidebooks would tell you is that like, oh, if an, if an animal is injured, it just dies. But there was a very real, sense that that her, that particular herd had taken on the role of taking care of that elephant hmm. yeah it's very it's beautiful yeah. yeah and so I, I there was a concept that sort of came out of just you know talking about you know being resistant to the norms and the inside out philosophy and you kind of touched on it a bit earlier and it's the idea of being the wild one or the wild one inside of us or the wild man or wild woman. Maybe you can just expand yeah. on that just a little bit and like how that sort of ties into your work that you do now. Uh, sure. I mean, there's an, there's an old myth 
called the myth of iron john which is it's a story of the of the discovery of a wild man that has been locked the, the discovery of the wild man and then the wild man is locked away in civilization and part of the recovery of more of ourselves is to get the wild man out and to, you know to get him out of prison and to go through a series of awakenings to start to bring the wild man back to life inside of us it's very you can think of the wild man as how would i say it like it's a very deep little part of you that is that is wild that is oh, that is wild that is ungovernable but also has access to some of what you are meant to do and who you are meant to be and so part of the part of any kind of inner work is to discover that wilder part of you and start to bring it to life and the wild man is a kind of integrity the wild man is a kind of it's a kind of boundary presence the wild man there are so many dynamics to the wild man but if you can if you can awaken the wild man in yourself you start to awaken a lot of knowing about what your path is and you also start to awaken the intensity and the the drive and some of the the personal power that it takes to continue to follow that you could think of it as a kind of radical integrity in the way that animals have like they don't pretend for anyone they know what they what what they are a lion knows it's a lion you know you know you've lost the wild man when you find yourself like sucking up to your boss for a promotion or making the right noises uh, in the environment so that you could get ahead and, and there's something about like or pretending to like someone who you don't really like because you know that's what we do here that's when you know you've lost the wild man the wild man is has too much integrity for that the wild man cares wild man the wild man is never going to allow you to buy shares in a company that'll make you rich but destroy a river you know it's that kind of deep seated knowing and integrity and it's it takes work to get the wild man back because you have to go down into a little bit of your shadow you have to go down into some parts of yourself that you know a lot of people don't know how to go down into mm. that's an, that's an important person to find that's for sure so so yeah. boyd you you mentioned before we actually started the podcast that that one of the things that is kind of like really coming up for you right now is tracking and you you want to speak about that a little bit more we've probably touched on little parts of it but uh, m- maybe you want to kind of just explain a little bit more about you know what it is what tracking is and and what it means for you in this whole context of life and everything sure yeah i mean <clears throat> I mean the core of it is you no know, I grew up learning the art form of tracking, how you follow an animal across terrain. And that's what I thought I was learning to do, follow animals. And then later when my life changed and I started getting into uh, inner work and starting to try and find the, the path of the authentic life, I realized that so much of the principles of tracking an animal could be applied how you start to find your path how you start to move forward towards what's calling you and so the, again for me it's always these you know two strange Venn diagrams started to come together and i'll give you a few examples you know one of the things about uh, trackers is trackers continuously go without knowing so one of the first movements of tracking is like there's an animal out there somewhere you don't know where it is you can't be certain of anything you don't know if it's moving you don't know where it might be and you go anyway if you start looking for your authentic life one of the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to have to get comfortable with beginning without knowing how you know you're going to have to go without knowing and most people say to me when i know exactly what i'm going to do then i'll start making the moves towards it and in my experience usually transformation begins with saying i don't know i know i'm looking for something i don't know how to start i don't know how to get there so you know you can see those parallels the next thing is is trackers do something called they develop track awareness so they if you go out with a great tracker they start to see track 
and it's an amazing idea because you know i might show you a track that you can't see but as you develop more and more track awareness the idea is that there is information there you just have to tune yourself to see it so when you start to drop into this place of unknown where you're looking for your authentic life like there is information but you're going to have to start tuning yourself to see it like one of the examples of the way you would attune yourself to see it is to stop thinking about rationally what you should be doing and just tune into the way your body starts to say yes so you know like when you see someone you hear someone you're involved in activity and you just feel more energy in your body you feel more aliveness you feel more like you feel yourself almost pulled out of your chair that would be an example of developing track awareness starting to pay attention to when that's happening in your life because it's going to start to show you what's more essential to you and another example is like working with what i call the first track uh what a tracker will do is like in an infinite wilderness where a lion could have gone anywhere um all the tracker needs is the first track and then the next first track and then the next first track and by by doing that they take all of that possibility of where that animal could have gone to a moment of presence then a moment of presence then a moment of presence and so you know in our own lives as we start to go on this journey like we probably don't know what the final outcome of it will be um and yet moment to moment we have to take a small step towards what feels a little bit more alive today what feels a little bit better like i couldn't have said to you um you know 8 years ago that i'm going to be like when i think of my career what it's going to be is i'm going to be a tracking storytelling uh uh, ceremony facilitator um, and podcaster you know that's like it's going to be like this weird Venn diagram like it wasn't that it was like oh I like tracking I'm going to track a bit first track oh I really like telling stories I'm going to do that a bit I, it was a series of small movements that started to come together into something that looks like oh that's a really like interesting and unusual Venn diagram it was never planned like that it was just attending to things moment to moment and so and so in the in, and there's and there's a few more of them you know there's um we always say never track alone like build trackers always get other good trackers around them quickly um uh understand that it's a process of discovery rather than like trying to work out where the animal is uh, trackers are so committed to the process they just stay in the process it's all about doing the tracking rather than finding the animal finding the animal is an outcome that that emerges out of the willingness to stay in their process um so there's just so much that you can learn from from tracking about living you know yeah, yeah. so th those are just some of the principles i'm probably going to have to jump off in about 10 if that's all right oh yeah perfect um so uh gareth where should we maybe we should just yeah no cool. yeah well let, let's yes. kind of like bring it home then um i guess uh boyd so so maybe you know look there, there's been so much that you've shared with us already i guess just in terms of through your stories a lot of advice has just come out of those but uh what are two great bits of advice that you could offer our listeners that have helped you in in your life sure that's really uh that's really interesting. Okay. Well, let's st let's stay there with with track awareness. You know, I think there's a few things. The one is one of the ways to really uh, start to awaken the wild man and start to bring a certain kind of integrity into your life, and to start to um, to start to see what's really important to you is work with yes and no. So when someone asks you to do something, say yes when you really mean yes and say no when you really mean no. And you'll, what you'll find is that as someone asks you something, there's usually like, um, there's like a moment where you can tune into your integrity and actually before you answer, wait for it and see if that no or that yes arises. Um, you know, there might be a desire to caretake. You might be afraid if I say no now, there won't be enough. But if you just actually wait for the integrity and say yes or no, it's going to start to take you into really interesting places and, and it's going to start to put you into your integrity in a really deep way. So that's one thing. The other thing that I would say is um, really pay attention to curiosity. You know, like curiosity is one of the ways that life pulls you 
to a destiny beyond what you could imagine for yourself. And you will naturally be curious about what's most essential to you. So if you just, you know, tune into curiosity, it's going to start to, to pull you, um, I'm going to start to pull you towards that authentic life. So those would be, you know, two things that I would say are fun to play with. Mm, brilliant. Thanks, man. Just, yeah, I guess, yeah, probably the second last question uh, before Craig finishes this off for us. What are you most excited about for the future for yourself? Um, and also, you know, where can people then get in touch with you and uh, sort of, yeah, find out more about you? <clears throat> and that's, uh, I'm excited about so many things at the moment. I continue to be really excited about our Track Your Life retreats. It's the most fun that I know how to have in the, the bush with people, taking people tracking in South Africa. I'm really excited about the next season of the Track Your Life podcast. We're going to, I'm looking at doing an exploration of the sacred. So, there's a whole lot of places out on the land here that are that are really like sacred sites. And I've been asking myself, like, what makes the sacred sacred? Like, how do you know it when you encounter it? Like, it's unseen, but when something sacred is happening, like, we know it, we see it. So what is that that, that sort of creates that? So those are, those, those are probably the two things that are really up for me right now. And... I'm excited to, you know, continue to try and do work that accelerates the shift in consciousness of the planet, of people on the planet. I think that's what we're in right now. And I just feel like the goal is to try and tell as many stories and touch as many lives and, and gather as many people together who feel a part of that movement as possible. Mm. Awesome, man. And where can people get in touch with you, Boyd? What's the best way to... Yeah, so the best way is just onto my website at voidvati.com and pretty much everything is on there, podcasts, retreat information, anything, books, Lion Tractor's Guide to Life and Cathedral. So yeah, voidvati.com, that's the best place to jump on and awesome. you can find, find it all there. Yeah. Beautiful. We highly, I mean, it's the, the possibly the best idea ever to have a healing sanctuary in the bush like that, just epic, literally. <laughs> so just our last question there, Boyd, like, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? I think it's, I mean, firstly, I think it's such a great uh, title that you guys have come up with for the show and for the exploration. Um, to me, it means that you do the work to be authentically yourself. And people who, who really uh, do that, being around them, they just have a, like a kind of a natural originality. And that originality, when you start to see it in, you go to groups of people who've done a lot of inner work, you just see this incredible array of gifts. You see this incredible array of originality. You see these people who are very free and open with themselves. You see people who laugh easily. You see the full spectrum of what it means to be ridiculously human and, mm. and how deep and beautiful and unique that is for each person. And so to me, it's the discovery and the maintenance of living in your authentic life. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much, Boyd. Listen, uh, just from my side briefly, this has been an absolute education and an inspiration, uh, as are you and your books and your podcast. And I think you're totally embodying the shift of consciousness uh, within yourself and you radiate that 100% uh, in a strong fashion. And uh, I think myself and you know, Gareth and, and anyone that's listening uh, definitely finds this, themselves being drawn to your authentic wild man's sort of energy, which is, which is really cool. And it, it transmits uh, through this technology, believe it or not. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much. And we love the fact that you've been able to integrate that through the tracking, all these analogies, you know, that and metaphors for life, it's just so true and so beautiful. Like the, the masculine and the feminine coming together to be this beautifully congruent thing. And I think people are going to gain so much from following your work and we highly encourage people to go and check out your stuff. So just thanks again for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Guys, thanks so much for having me and 
yeah, I really enjoyed getting to spend a little time with you and I'm excited about your show and I, I just, uh, you guys have got such great energy. So I can't wait to see how it just continues to affect people. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thanks so much, Boyd. Boyd, and just literally briefly from me, man, thanks so much for coming on the show. What a, seriously, what a legend, bad luck. Um, after listening to the podcast, I was like so excited, your podcast, I was so excited to speak to you because I just, I could feel like you, you've spoken a lot about it, this, this shift in consciousness, but I could feel like you've had this massive kind of shift in consciousness over your life and you, you, you're kind of operating on a bit of a different level and, and there's a certain energy about that, which, which is just kind of infectious and there's so much about you and the way you tell your story and the wisdom that you hold and the wisdom that you share that is extremely powerful and, and beneficial for so many people in the world. And um, you've just kind of like given us a taste of that, I think, in, in this podcast. So thank you so, so much for sharing that and uh, seriously just wishing you all the best with absolutely serious, everything that you, that you have going on, everything that, uh, that's coming up in the future and yeah, but you, you, you're a very special man. So thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate it. That's very kind of you. Thanks, thanks brother. No worries, bud. <laughs>